We are now recording. Hello, everyone. I'm Erin Nevius, ACRL's content strategist. Thank you for joining us today for this webinar offered as part of ACRL's Together Wherever virtual event. Our goal for these webinars is to bring our colleagues together to discuss ways to best meet the needs of the library community during this uncertain time and beyond. We appreciate you being with us today. If you like, feel free to pop a brief introduction of yourself and say hello in the chat box while I go over a few reminders. As previously mentioned, today's session is being recorded. We'll post the link to the recording on the ACRL Together Wherever website. The ALA Statement of Appropriate Conduct applies to all ACRL events, including virtual, and we encourage respectful discourse on Twitter using hashtag ACRLTogether2020. This presentation will be one hour in length and will leave the Zoom room open for an additional 20 minutes after the presentation for optional additional networking and questions. You can also join the ACRL Together Wherever ALA Connect community to connect with your fellow attendees and continue discussions about the presentations. When you choose to depart the session, you'll see a brief evaluation and we greatly appreciate your thoughts and feedback. Thank you in advance. This webinar is the Invisible Labor in Archives and Special Collection Libraries. I'd like to thank our panelists, Brittany Adams, Emily Beck, Abigail Connick, and Robin DeMuel for being with us today. Panelists, feel free to start whenever you're ready. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Um, my name is Brittany Adams. I am the Special Collections Digitization and Archival Services Librarian at the Northwestern Pritzker School of Law. I am Chair of the RBMS ALA Annual Program Planning Committee for 2020. Um, and unfortunately, we can't be in person, but I'm really excited to be able to bring this here digitally. Um, and on behalf of the committee, I'll be chairing. And I wanna say thank you to my fellow committee members. We have Gina DuVernay, Jennifer King, Der Derek Mosley, Gregory Seppi, Kelly Warren, and Megan Griffin. So thank you very much for your help in preparing with this panel. And without further ado, I would love to introduce our panelists. Abigail, if you'd like to start. No pressure. All right, um, we'll all dive right in. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Abigail Connick. I graduated from the University of Illinois. I've seen, noticed a couple of you are from there, so hi. Um, with my MLS in 2017, I currently work as the Rare Books Technical Services Project Librarian at Smith College in Northampton, Massachusetts. So, um, and I can't recall, are we just doing that or are we also including our other stuff at this point too? Totally up to you, Abigail. Okay. Um, I'll just do kind of a brief background then of what I do in this job. Um, so, my main focus is accessioning and cataloging the sizable backlog that we have in the Mortimer Rare Book Collection. Um, and I've also been tasked with conducting an inventory of the 45,000 plus item collection. So uh, plenty of stuff on my plate, but I'm excited to be here. Thanks, Abigail. And Emily, if you'd like to talk next. Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Emily Beck, and I am the Assistant Curator of the Wangenstein Historical Library of Biology and Medicine at the University of Minnesota. Um, so my training is actually as a historian of medicine. I earned my PhD um, after completing a dissertation on the history of uh, pre-modern medical recipe books uh, in northern and central Italy. Um, the Wangenstein Library was founded in the late 1960s. It contains about 72,000 volumes and 8,000 artifacts from the 1430s to the 1930s. Uh, we are a full-time staff of two at the Wangenstein, and we're lucky to have a couple of student employees and a cataloger who spends part of her week with us. Um, in a typical year, of which this is not one, uh, we engage with lots of community outreach events, mentor interns, actively add to our collection, and teach around 100 course sessions. The majority of these visits are unique preps um, that are focused on specific course content. So um, like the history of contraceptives in 20th century America would be an example. Um, I was initially interested in participating in this panel as a way to talk about the invisible labor of teaching instructors. Uh, behind those course sessions are countless meetings and emails. 
um, in which I work closely with instructors to write assignments, uh, shift course goals, adjust syllabi, um, and sometimes even write entire courses with, with instructors. Um, I'm also interested in talking today about some invisible labor that happens at the Wangenstein as it relates to diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, especially around our collection development and teaching with East Asian materials and Western herbalism. Awesome, thanks Emily. And Robin, last but not least. Hello, um, good afternoon. It's noon here in Montreal. I am Robin Demon, and I am a cataloging librarian at McGill University Library uh, in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Uh, my job entails cataloging rare books exclusively. I'm part of a team of nine individuals. We're very lucky at McGill to have this pod of expertise to work on a special collections. I work with, uh, I like to say anything old and weird, um, so that includes things out of our rare books and special collections library, but I also um, do a very large amount of work in, for the Oslo Library of the History of Medicine. So it's nice to have another HISMED person on this panel with me. Uh, I am very interested in this panel for a number of reasons. One, um, as my job is literally to enter catalog entries anonymously, um, it's about the visibility of my work. It's also about the visibility of the work of my colleagues. Uh, particularly when it comes to technical infrastructure and when it comes to the work required, especially under COVID, to realize services online. And that includes uh, the kind of presentation we're doing today, but also digitization for online access. Thank you. Well, thank you all for introducing yourselves. Uh, when we were first coming up with the theme for this year's panel, um, we were really just kind of interested in discussing there's a lot of kind of mystique and veil sometimes behind special collections and, and within that there's even a little bit of um, a veil between what is seen and what is unseen. And so we thought this would be a good way to kind of talk about not only the issues that are unseen, but also what we can do to make them more visible and more understood. Um, as we work towards access, we kind of want to lift that veil a little bit. So that's a little bit of a background on this session. And in preparation, we've had several really great conversations about the invisible work that we do and the invisible work of special collections. And especially with recent events, we would love to talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, however, we also recognize that we are four white women up here. So especially our colleagues of color and different perspectives, we really encourage you to speak up in the chat and to contribute to the conversation. The format of this panel is going to be a moderated discussion. Uh, we want this just to be kind of a time to talk and to listen and to learn from each other. Um, so again, we will definitely be doing a Q&A later on and we want to hear from you and, and have you be a part of this as well. And in the meantime, um, let's get the conversation started. So the first question I have is, what does the concept invisible labor mean to you in your work? Is it okay if I start? Oh yes, please, just jump in. So I think um, invisible labor means a couple of things. Uh, on the one hand, it means the work that we, so at the very general level, basic level, it's the work that we don't see. It's the work that we do that isn't heard, that isn't seen, that also isn't maybe valued. And I think the other side of that is um, the juicy question as to why it's invisible and what the implications of that are. Yeah, I, th I think that's that's exactly it for me too. It's the stuff that isn't seen, but it's the stuff also that is um, assumed without being fully understood. So like, yes, this uh, object is appearing in your hands, but, but how exactly? Right, exactly. Someone had to describe it for you to find it, right? Someone had to find it, which in a special collections library can be an adventure. Yes. <laughs> Um, how, how is this invisibility problematic both to your role in, as well as to the field in general? And what does it mean to have your work be unseen? I think I in, oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Emily. <laughs> oh, I'm both too polite. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I think uh, it, 
in, in my world, um, having the invisible labor of um, behind teaching means that um, in some ways it undermines being recognized as an expert, both with, within and outside of the library. So um, if there isn't sort of the clear understanding that, you know, books, um, books don't just appear on the tables for students, right? There's a lot of uh, research behind it, a lot of thought behind it um, that makes it, makes me able to teach sort of comfortably across multiple disciplines. Um, and, and if all of that is invisible, then how do you know that I'm doing anything other than putting books on cradles? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think another problem, uh, especially on the cataloging side, um, but also, I mean, with being a curator, is timing. Um, quite often, I'll have either my boss or colleagues, you know, present an idea of, oh, wouldn't this be great? And I'm like, that would take so many hours to even remotely start thinking about it. It's like, okay, let's back up. Let's talk about the timing of when you're hoping to get this done, because that's, you know, that may be a considerable lift for me to do. Um, and because, you know, uh, I, I see kind of part of my job being um, kind of like a magician in the sense that you don't actually see all of what's going on. You just kind of see the end result. Um, it can be really hard to kind of walk back and go, okay, let's walk through this together and let me explain just how complicated some of this may actually be. <laughs> and Abigail, thank you. Um, oh, that's some interesting feedback. Um, Abigail, would you mind talking a little bit too about the background of your position and, and kind of the invisible labor that you inherited as well? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, so I am, as far as I'm, I can tell, uh, the first full-time cataloger for the Mortimer Rare Book Collection. Um, there were temporary catalogers who were able to hop on board um, as well as one woman who oversaw those te temporary catalogers, but I'm the first full-time trained cataloger on staff. Um, however, on the flip side of that is I'm also temporary. <laughs> so I've got three years to do as much good as I can for the catalog um, before I disappear into the abyss. Um, and so it's, it's tricky because there's so many different things of, hey, you know, let's do this and let's do that. And you ultimately have to prioritize and say, okay, what is actually feasible in this three year period. Um, and that's a difficult thing to do because you just want to fix it all and make the catalog spotless and pretty and it just isn't going to work. Um, <laughs> so um, uh, another tricky thing, what? How many volumes did you say this collection is as well? Uh, it's about 45,000. <laughs> so. And your first full-time cataloger. Yeah, yeah, so. Um, which has been interesting doing the inventory. But um, the other tricky part is that the uh, Smith College uh, about half a decade ago decided to consolidate its special collections so that the college archives, which I noticed Nancy Young's on this call, so hi Nancy, um, the Sophia Smith collection and the Mortimer Rare Book collection now all live under one umbrella. Um, which is great. We can share skills. The problem is, is that out of a staff of about 21, there's only about four people who are very familiar with rare books. So when I try to explain something, not only do I have to um, kind of break down what I'm talking about cataloging wise, I also have to come at it from a non book history perspective. So I have to walk out of not only my cataloging realm, but also the rare book realm, which is a little weird for me, um, but it's, I'm getting used to it. <laughs> so. So, and the, just to kind of dovetail um, what you guys have been discussing, I mean, catalogers are constantly having to advocate for their work, right? This is not a new struggle, but also um, there's a way, and other people have said this more eloquently than I have, but there's a way in libraries where we tend to efface ourselves, right? Like you have this, this myth of the shelf, right? But there's all this work going into the shelf, but we write ourselves out of it. It was, um, and I wondered what you guys thought about that comment, maybe, if at all, if you see that. 
Well, in one of our um, previous discussions that we had, we talked about how in, uh, visibility is often correlated with value. Absolutely. And invisibility is often in, implicitly correlated then to a lack of value and how um, a lot of that happens before you see it in the classroom in Emily's case or on the shelf in Robin and Abigail's case. Um, how, how does that factor in? And Emily, I'd love to hear more about how like the curriculum planning side of that mm -hmm. also is um, a bit invisible. Yeah, I think um, it's, what is the, the value of it is, um, if it's not visible, then it can't be counted when it comes time for performance reviews and other kinds of things. So sometimes I think about um, the amount of research that it takes for the teaching that I do and that it seems to take for catalogers in order to create a super great record is not typically understood as, as far as I've been able to tell in performance evaluations as part of the research enterprise. Right, so like a, a publication has a very specific type of value when it comes to sort of being part of the profession and showing enough progress or whatever when it comes time for promotion and other things. But, um, you know, and not saying that one record or one class equals a, um, a publication, but it does take a ton of research and a ton of time. And so to sort of, you know, I, I wonder if it were less invisible, more visible, it could, these things could be cast as part of research um, and understood and valued as part of that research that we add to sort of the whole scope of the mm -hmm. things that our libraries do. And I think that's actually deeply tied maybe in some ways by design in terms of um, the legacy of the feminization of library work and the uh, history of how that implicates the value of our work. Not only is it hard to see in some cases, not only is it not seen and then not valued, but then you have this um, drilling and also um, this overarching structure that serves to maybe in some ways undermine the work that we're doing before we're even able to advocate for it. And Robin, uh, would you talk a little bit more about that research that you've done on the feminization of the field and the, um, the deprofessionalization, I believe you called it? I may have that term wrong, but I found right. that really fascinating and that kind of ties into the invisibility of what we're doing. Right, and this is, this is a body of literature that's been growing since the 70s, right? So you have uh, feminists uh, writers such as Dean Garrison talking about how the roots of our profession, right? So you think about that time. Um, and uh, Sean Higgins wrote this chapter of in, like, oh, I'm going to forget the term. Hang on, I have it. Uh, <laughs> sorry, it's in resistance to a capitalist path, right? And, and they talk about, and they're one of, this is one of the studies that, that talks about the root of our profession and the foundational principles and the way that women were treated in the workforce. Right? So what these scholars have done since then is looked at the way that women were seen as a source of maybe cheaper labor, right? And, and how that underlying assumption, I'm not saying that it's conscious at all times uh, in 2020, maybe for some people it is, but I don't think it's conscious of everyone, but it, it has imbued certain understandings in our profession, right? They haven't done us any favors in the sense of the way that um, in a public facing role like Emily, the way that the service is supposed to be presented, for example, or the expectations that the work be done. Or in my example, that it's just data entry. And I'm noticing in some of the, um, in some of the comments that people are talking about this, which is great, um, <laughs> but the, the work doesn't just happen, right? When you look at a pen, when you look at a pencil, like people made this, stuff went into this, but we don't see that. And that is something that, um, is hard to remember, but we must remember in order to get that value for our work and to have it not just acknowledged, but maybe even remunerated, paid and supported in our institutions, right? To maybe not hack our technology departments completely, or our cataloging departments just completely. I'm taking the floor a lot, but my, so please, 
Jump in. So well, okay. I just want to highlight as well, you know, Robin, you said you work on a team of, is it eight or nine catalogers? There's eight plus my supervisor. Eight plus a supervisor. Yeah. Oh, you're still working in a large research institution. And I know you've talked a lot about working with um, materials of languages that may not be in the Roman alphabet um, or maybe in other expertise. So you still have kind of a lot going on there. Abigail, obviously, is the first full time cataloger in this huge collection that she's working with and she's inherited kind of piecemeal work that's come before her and Emily works on a staff a professional staff of two teaches about a hundred courses uh, per year and does um, uh, you are a co-curator right or assistant curator assistant assistant curator so there's a lot going on here even um, you know outside just the general job title there's a lot of work going on um, so one of the other questions we talked about that I think is kind of interesting is when we talk about invisible labor, who is this or yeah, who is this work invisible to? Um, is it to patrons? Is it to coworkers, bosses, the institution? When we talk about the invisibility, where are we finding the biggest burden? Um, I'm happy to start off with that one because mine's a bit of a peculiar situation in the fact that pretty much everyone except for the rare book curator. Um, uh, my job is fairly invisible, um, including my boss, um, because he's an archivist. So um, he and I often have to kind of find a middle ground where we actually understand each other, <laughs> um, which is a little weird, but we make it work. And so um, it's really interesting. Be, um, I because I've gotten used to it over the last two years, you, you don't notice it as much until you start talking with other catalogers. And I can say something like, yeah, I'm doing an inventory project. And they're like, oh, bless you. We're so sorry that you're taking on such an enormous project. Whereas many of my coworkers are like, oh, that's nice. I'm like, hmm, okay, clearly there's a disconnect between what you see and what I'm doing. Um, so how can I make this more visible? Of, yes, this is a huge deal of what I'm doing. Um, because it's not just inventory, but we were also like solidifying locations because we moved and it's the whole hot metadata mess. Um, <laughs> so uh, it's, it's interesting because um, uh, have, having to explain myself really at, any, at every turn um, in, in order to um, not just justify my work, but make it visible. Um, I, I think also a great way that I've tried to do this is even just outside of my work, you know, explaining to my mom what I do um, is tricky enough. And so I often take that as a framework of, okay, so if I'm explaining to someone completely outside of the library profession, you know, what do they need to know what I do, you know, including things like the, the, the varied skill set, you know, and telling my mom in college, yeah, I need to learn languages. And she's like, but why? Well, that's one of, you know, 10 million skill sets I need for this job. <laughs> yeah. you know, um, or even uh, uh, we have a temporary cataloger who also works at Smith, um, who's well-trained, has been in the field for decades. And um, sometimes I'll walk up to him and go, I've got no idea, you know, what on earth is going on here? And he can actually sit down and explain. Whereas most of my colleagues would go, I don't know, you know, it's, I don't know, that's, that's not our wheelhouse. So it's, it's a fine balance, you know, trying to find kind of allies to my work. And I think the temporary nature of your position also speaks to the invisibility within the institution. I, um, just as an anecdote, I had a wonderful intern uh, who was beginning her career and her first job was um, as an archivist for an architectural firm. And they said, yeah, we thought this would be a great three month summer pro uh, project <laughs> to do an entire archives. And so I think when we look at positions, especially such as yours, I mean, you're lucky enough to have three years, but that's still a temporary position and kind of a blip in the uh, institutional history. And, and like you've said before, you're dealing with the inconsistencies of, you know, even smaller temporary workers um, before. That's a lot of invisibility of, of how much is going in. Yeah, exactly. Um, and it, one thing that I have noticed um, in, in talking with the curator is that when this position was initially created, people were definitely confused as to why we needed it because it was virtually invisible. It didn't exist. 
Um, but I've definitely noticed a shift that the longer that I've been in this position and the more that I bring up and even just the ability to find things better in the catalog, um, I've noticed my colleagues have definitely started thinking, oh, maybe there's some value here. It's like, yay, they're getting it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's, it's nice to be able to kind of chip away at that invisibility layer, so to speak. Um, but yeah, it's a work in progress. It always is. Um, Emily or Robin, be able to tell us who your work is invisible to? Yeah, um, so I think our, my work is invisible, some of my work is invisible both to instructors as well as to coworkers. So um, I am fortunate that I have uh, affiliate faculty status in two departments on campus. So there are a lot of faculty I work with who understand perfectly well um, the work that I'm doing to help in their classes. Um, but I still uh, feel a lot of skepticism from some instructors. So, um, for example, uh, medical doctors are slightly suspicious sometimes that I could have anything to add in their classes. Um, and, you know, I, I had the opportunity to sit in on gross anatomy with the medical students one year, and that has given me some street cred. Um, but, it, you know, it's it's hard to convince some faculty that, that you might have um, something to add, um, be able to have an intervention in a class rather than just be sort of a support staff person for a particular session. Um, and in terms of coworkers, I think that, um, you know, teaching in special collections is really different than teaching in um, other parts of the library. Um, and so they don't, maybe quite understand the complexity of the requests that we're getting and the type of work that you need to do in, in order to fulfill those requests. So for example, um, I remember a request where um, a history of technology faculty wanted their class to come in to look at images of hands. Um, so not images of hands like from anatomy textbooks, which would be easy, but images of hands manipulating instruments. There's no, there's no way to, like that's just my brain. Right, like so, the the ability to fill requests like that um, is sort of that invisible research and time um, that I think we're talking about. And that takes a strong familiarity and knowledge with the collection, which yeah. takes time as well. Right, right, and that 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 thinking time is really crucial, and that if that can't be um, considered a fundamental part of your job, then it's really hard to do that effectively and then do the rest of your job effectively. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Robin, what about you? Yeah, so just kind of to, again, bring both comments together, you guys are making awesome points. Um, just what's invisible, I mean, we're a unicorn, right? I, I, like my job came out of a, strategic, a specific strategic intention to address our special collections backlog, right? Like the department that we have is very special and I recognize the privilege of that. And I think, um, it, but it's still not necessarily imminent to my colleagues that we are, like the, the, that the detail and the work that we do is actually directly tied to user needs, right? That that isn't, that like, that the detail that goes into a cataloging record is more than just the title because researchers need more than just the title, right? They care about, we know as uh, book history nerds that like they, they want to know who touched it. They want to know what it looks like, right? They want to know what happened to it and who owned it and how many stamps are on it. And like, and that, and, and the role and that that requires us to be many things at once. So, and I also, oh, oh sorry, Abigail. Go ahead, Robin. <laughs> I was gonna say also like this, like coming back to all of the work that Emily's doing and like, and how we think of ourselves. And again, thinking about how uh, labor is understood and how precarity undermines on some level on, or maybe every level, um, the meaning of that work from the frame point, from a framing of an institution. Uh, it's also interesting to think about what kind of gaps that creates in our own library histories. Right, um, because then are we valuing the work that we do in house? Are we valuing the conservation work? How is that documented? Um, and, and that rich inner history of the book, are we also 
kind of like cutting our nose off to spite our face with that as well. Well, and I think that's why I felt really strongly about bringing our cataloger into the classroom with me um, to say that she has expertise that I do not have, but that I think the students that I work with could benefit from. Um, and I think, you know, not everyone goes into their jobs wanting to sort of be a teacher and have that sort of forced upon them. But if you're willing to do it, then I think it's a huge advantage for students, especially graduate level students who need to do research. They need to understand the catalog. Who better to talk to them than a cataloger? Yeah, and just piggybacking off of that, um, Emily, I think in an earlier conversation, you had explicitly mentioned that catalogers, because we're the ones ultimately helping to create the infrastructure, we're then also ideal for helping to explain it, how it all works to other people. Um, and I, I, I think one great anecdote from grad school was I did a one-off, um, I took a medieval bibliography class, which was just uber nerdy of me. And it was fascinating because there were about three of us in there who were library science students, whereas everyone else was um, typically an English major. And the, um, the ability for us to be able to just work within these databases because we knew how they worked, um, whereas many of the you know, PhD uh, English souls were kind of going, what on earth is all of this? And so we were in class able to walk through why some of these things you know, worked this way and what linked data looks like and stuff like that, because that's what we had been learning. Um, and I think just as catalogers in general of saying, oh yeah, like, no, you don't need to know Mark, but this is why authors are this way, or this is why editors are here, or you know, this is where you can find the publishers, because surprise, we've added them for you, you know? Um, and just kind of, you know, kind of opening up the hood just a little bit, you know, to kind of give them a, a glimpse into how they can leverage that data even better. Well, and with historical scholarship moving more and more in many disciplines toward work with um, very large data sets, mm -hmm. um, it, you know, it's not just the English majors who need you, right? It's like anyone doing digital humanities, uh, large data set research could benefit. So I'm debating, I feel like there's a couple different ways that this conversation could go in a good way. Um, so I think, <laughs> um, so we've talked a little bit about how our colleagues often don't necessarily see um, let alone the patrons. And I think it's going to be hard to educate the patrons on the work that we do. It's, it's, it's like going to a restaurant. You don't expect the chef to sit there and show you everything. You just want the meal. Um, but I think we can certainly like strive to work together better. So what do you wish that um, your colleagues knew about the, the invisible labor? And how can we work to make this labor less invisible um, for the good of everyone? I think conversations like this should help, right? Like where we can just sort of talk about it. Um, I would, in terms of teaching, I'd be super happy to have more people in the classroom with me, shadowing, offering suggestions, um, whatever, to try to um, understand what, what that looks like, what it looks like to teach across disciplines um, and teach content in special collections. Um, I think we just have to sort of witness what each other are doing to start to make a change. Emily, you've talked about, in some cases, completely crafting course syllabi with an instructor. Mm -hmm. um, how have you made your expertise known and, and how do you um, make that labor known within your department and, and outside your department? Because um, a lot to carry on top of uh, an assistant curator loan. This is not all that, or load, I mean, this is not all that you do. Yes. yes. Um, what do I do? I, <laughs> I, I, I tend to just do stuff and not really say much. So like, that's my own fault that a lot of this is invisible, right? And that's because I love teaching, um, which should be clear at this point. And I, I like doing curriculum development. And I like thinking of um, creative ways that 
students can engage with uh, primary source material at both the undergraduate and the graduate level. And so the way that I've decided um, to do that is to find faculty colleagues who are willing to teach a class with me as a co-instructor of record. Um, so they know pretty clearly what I'm doing. Um, and so I feel a lot of respect from them and from those departments that decide to take me on as sort of uh, a temp faculty or affiliate faculty member. Um, in terms of within my department, I'm not sure um, that um, it comes up much. Um, so I'm, I'm not really sure how, mm -hmm. how what everyone else knows. About Are you included it. in faculty meetings and in curriculum meetings? Sometimes. And does yep. that help? Uh, within the departments or within my own, within the faculty Are departments? There? Um, I think it does. So uh, I have a, a meeting with the faculty of one department coming up and that's a department where I hold affiliate status and where we teach in the majority of those classes. So um, it sort of on their, in their minds, I think in the, in the chair's mind makes sense for us to be involved. And I say us, meaning me and the, and the curator um, to be involved because we're involved in all the classes anyway. So if there are big decisions to be made, um, then, then they want to make sure that we can still do the things that they want us to do. Um, that's sort of the, the biggest integration into curriculum that we have at a departmental level. Um, I'd say one thing for me, especially with staff, um, is that I'm very blessed to have very curious coworkers. Um, it's it's not like this position didn't exist because you know they didn't care about the rare books they really want to learn um and so it's fun because you know uh you know i'll find either student workers or um the reading room supervisor you know in the stacks and we'll kind of run into each other and i'll say oh goody look what i just found or she'll show me something and i'll explain something to her oh i didn't know that and so we have this informal information exchange which is really fun um i've also noticed that because we all um, many of us work in the same building, um, even just simply the parts of books that I have <laughs> around me, um, they'll go, oh, these are interesting. Oh, did you know about this one? And I'll just pull one randomly off and start chatting about it. Um, or they'll see um, uh, some of the stabilization work that my students and I were doing um, and bring over books from like the archives and say, hey, can you help me with this? You know, I've noticed that you had, that you have skills in this please help. Um, and just those, I think, informal information exchanges have been hugely helpful to um, really kind of surface some of that invisible labor that I'm doing and the expertise that I have, so, which is always good. So I think from, uh, on my end, it's kind of, one of the things that's been the most interesting, I'm just processing both of your comments. What, one of the best things I think for me not to only um, be able to share what I do, but also to see all the work that my colleagues are doing, um, has been uh, working as one of the co-curators of our rare Instagram account, actually, because I got to work directly with curators. We worked um, and we all worked in different buildings uh, for a while and different departments. I mean, I was a cataloger on the team and we had um, our head of digital projects for a while and we all had different pieces of the pie and it was such a delicious kind of learning experience for us and also to help us advocate uh, through the organization for all the different work that we did right to help make it see be seen because i think it's possible to appreciate what your colleague does without really understanding like that what you see is always the tip of the iceberg is that an ongoing project or is that, yeah. Is that a yeah, 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 we're still doing it. We're still doing it. It's just, we've had like it, the account's been around for a few years. So um, we have people come and go in an institution. So we have different, we have slightly different members, but like it's, it, we're still, um, it's still curator, cataloger, other like archives. It's just like different. Yeah, it's a mix. That's Art, awesome. we've had some, yeah. So. That's fantastic. Um, and then I think 
we want to open this up to discussion soon. So I'm going to finish up with one or two more questions. Okay, so how is this invisible labor that you do necessary to the goals of your institution, especially access? So as we think about access, how is your invisible labor um, crucial to that work? And, and, and how does demystifying it maybe help as well? Um, I'm, I'm happy to start on that and take it as an opportunity to talk about the diversity, equity, and inclusion stuff that we've been up to. Um, so um, the Wangenstein for the past about 10 years have been um, adding primarily pre-1800 East Asian materials to the collection. Um, this is, it started as a collection that was basically 100% Western, um, and we decided for a wide variety of reasons that we needed to um, shift that to be more representative of um, sort of the multiple histories of healthcare modalities rather than being sort of uh, focused primarily on the development of modern biomedicine. Um, we don't have very many people coming in from East Asian focused classes. Um, and I should say that I am by no means an expert in this. I don't speak any East Asian language. Um, I don't have official training in East Asian history, but I still feel like it's my responsibility to take these materials and put them into conversation with other materials that instructors are asking for. Um, some instructors do ask for a more global focus, but a lot of them don't. And so it's sort of my invisible labor to understand those materials as best that I can and bring them into classes sort of as an intervention um, so that students can see what um, you know, pre-modern Japanese anatomy images look like alongside um, pre-modern European images. And so we can have conversations about um, medicine and health as being culturally constructed, which is a course goal for a lot of uh, faculty to have their students understand things like that. But if they aren't explicitly asking me for a global focus, I think it's still my job to do that. Robin or Abigail? Um, well, I, I think with cataloging, especially in a special collections library, library is, you know, if it doesn't catalog, you can't find it. <laughs> it's plain and simple. Um, but even with uh, the inventory work that I've been doing, uh, quite often I found that I was getting pressure to catalog, which I felt myself, um, and I was at times getting very frustrated by the inventory project. But Ultimately, there, there were several goals with the inventory project, but one of the biggest ones of them all was because we moved from one location to another and suddenly it went from the rare book room cage and these weird arcane locations to like oversized and flat and standard. Um, I needed to make sure that the, page, the student pages could actually find the books. <laughs> um, and so it was hugely important because it wasn't just um, that researchers could locate the books in the catalog, but then also that our own staff could actually find our books. Um, and so, and then just, you know, seeing how they're, they're working in that system and then even training students to use the collection even better and understand call numbers and whatnot and all of our crazy systems that of course all libraries have. Um, and so that, that was a big thing that I kept reminding myself with the inventory project, especially was that, yes, this is a huge help because it's solidifying and controlling our data um, and our, our locations, which was hugely important. So. Oh, you guys are good. Um, I, <laughs> I think to add to this, uh, the things I'd like to add are one, I mean, Abigail's right. If it's not there, you can't find it. Um, a large part of my job has been cataloging the our backlog our original rare books library that is um and so uh for a, in a lot of ways unless unless you are able to come to a curator and say i'm thinking about this copy because uh curators have an immense amount of collections knowledge that like it's amazing um and like with barring that it's the first time that maybe 
uh, there is online access or access at all to certain items. I think I also want to point to, and this is work that I, that, um, I don't think any of us do, but maybe have a part in in some uh, machination is, especially under COVID, the increased demand for online access to materials, which brings us to another form of invisible labor, which is the digitization of objects. And that tends to also be uh, a kind of work that is undervalued. But crucial, so maybe we need I to- I feel that. <laughs> right? Yes, because you manage digital projects, correct? Yeah, 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 absolutely. You know, in, in other departments, I love it when they write and ask for stuff, but it's not just, you know, here's a copy of something, it's locating the item, choosing the correct form of digitization, it's, you know, preparing the item, it's post-processing. Um, I don't always have time for all the metadata, but, you know, that's, that's hugely important for future finding. Otherwise, you're just going to keep doing the same work over and over again. So, absolutely, 100%. Yeah. Um, and I think overarching throughout really all of our positions is, and one thing that I find just in general, is oftentimes when people say, especially with like digitization or cataloging, of, oh, well, can't you just, you know, already get, they, they assume that it, that data already exists somewhere. And the, so you kind of have to backtrack and say, no, a human has to put it there first, has to lay the foundation for whatever you want to do. If we've already digitized something, great, it's a snap, you know, I can send you the link, it's all good to go. But in order to get to that point, we have mm -hmm. to lay a solid foundation that, that requires labor from real human beings, not just, you know, machines. Um, and that's it's labor. It's really easy to forget. <laughs> yeah, well, and what you were saying, Abigail, about having, you know, there's, there's different skill sets that are required here. So it's not only a cataloging skill set, but it's a language skill set. It's um, a digital skill set, and, and now linked data is whoosh above my head, but I know that that's becoming the work of a lot of catalogers as well. So um, I think we've touched on a lot of excellent points, and I am really excited to see such an active chat going on. Yes. So that, let's open up um, to questions from our, our participants. Erin, um, would you mind helping us with that, please? No, happy to do it. And I'm, I'm going to surface some things that came in during your talk, which was wonderful. Um, so first, and to tie in with what, what you were just speaking about, uh, how does invisibility affect accountability? And what ways can those in the field hold themselves accountable in serving diverse communities? Um, I, I will take a stab at that. I think that um, in, in a way, I feel like a large part of the collection that I, I serve is invisible because it's uh, so large. And if you don't know things are there, then um, you would never ask for them or, or even think that you could ask for them. Um, and so I think it is easy for us to get too busy to deal with the materials that, are, that you don't know enough about or that seem a little scary or something. Um, and so I feel like it is, it's, yeah, it's just easy to sort of slip into saying, I don't, I don't understand that part of my collection, so I'm not gonna even try to bring it out. And I think, um, I don't know how to make ourselves more accountable to that other than just trying to do better, but especially when it's uh, materials that represent um, non-dominant voices, it is our responsibility to surface those materials and. Um, bring them into classes, bring them to our colleagues, um, consult with catalogers like you all to say, you know, can you help me figure out how I can make this more visible? Can we adjust the, um, adjust the subject headings or something um, to sort of make that a, a bigger group project to make sure that the things that need to be surfaced are if you don't mind me jumping in on that, Emily, I, I can understand that too, as someone who is also in charge um, of a, a collection in a somewhat curatorial role. One thing we were talking about at my institution was creating bibliographies um, of, of different uh, categories of books, which is great. But let me tell you, um, that requires an immense amount of research because um, you need to know what to look for. You need to know the different nuances. And I think especially you said you're working with East Asian um, 
a lot of East Asian materials. I'm assuming that those are not written in in English or in Roman. <laughs> so, you know, having that knowledge, I think, um, and prioritizing that knowledge. Um, I think we talked about that a little bit. Uh, Robin, you were talking about um, having to ask your colleagues for help with, with languages in order to make these things more visible. And we're even talking about hiring students who have that language background that, um, that we don't. Uh, I, for us, not necessarily, but okay. it is because we have, we have catalogers with language specialties. Okay. Um, so, but I don't doubt that this is a thing that must happen. And also to work with certain collections, you would have to have that linguistic knowledge. Mm -hmm. yeah. And sometimes like we found with our East Asian materials, the difficulty is that um, the farther back you go in time with the language, the less and less it starts to look like the language that you speak today. So, right, right. So yeah. even though I ask every student who comes in, if they speak Chinese, Japanese, Korean, they look at these things and they can, they can get some words, but it's just too difficult for them because it's not the way their language is today. And so it's, you know, not only asking our colleagues, but also like, putting things out into the world, write a blog post about it and see if someone else can help, help you answer these questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd, I'd say one thing that I'm very thankful of is that um, Smith, though, though I am a lone cataloger, I am not alone um, in the area um, because Smith is part of the five colleges. And I love that the five colleges as part of their um, as a whole, um, they've decided that in order to um, in order to provide better access for cataloging, they actually have a woman who has been working now for several years um, in uh, foreign languages, particularly um, Japanese and Chinese and Korean. Um, and so, it is amazing how much I have learned from her, and I'm I'm able to. Um, books that we especially some of the Japanese oh. books that we purchase I'm able to hand over to her and say thank you you know you're doing a beautiful job um, and then I kind of go back in and do kind of the rare book um, elements and it's great because um, you know we have conversations and she's able to connect me you know if she doesn't have an answer she knows people who do um, and I think that's just one thing in general um, that I thoroughly enjoy is that um, as librarians, we really have a beautifully networked community. Um, and so really, you just got to kind of reach out to someone and say, hey, do you have resources? Do you know someone who, you know, has something on this information that I know nothing about, you know, whether it's a material type or language type. Um, and it's, it's really neat, but it, it also, you kind of beat yourself up of saying, oh, I should know those languages or I should know this. So it's, it's a hard, it's a hard thing to balance. This is great. Um, here is a two part question for you. Uh, so much of this work winds up being in temporary visiting positions or specific discrete projects with an attitude of catch it up and be done with it for another 20 years. What can be done to address that employment precarity? And also, do you think that contemporary information abundance further devalues your work and increases job instability? Is it okay if I start? You guys should jump in though. We can be organic. Um, I definitely think that information overabundance is a blessing and a curse um, because it, it actually brings to light the same problem. And it's one of the things that I kind of came up like opened with, and that is the fact that the work around technology isn't seen very well, right? It just works. The internet just works. Um, and, and it's also, often taken for granted in that sense. And that means that it gets to be, um, that means that all the wonderful biases that go into building something, because we build the world in our own images for better or for worse, um, get instilled into that. So you have things like bias and algorithms, bias and description, and, um, and also bias and understanding of work and what's valued and what it is. So maybe in terms of the precarity question, it has to be, I'm not sure, um, 
what the best path is, but it has to be, it, it's not an easy discussion, but it's a necessary discussion to A, fight precarious labor in all its forms, firstly, and secondly, to really bring forward that this work is essential to the functioning of the library, of the organization, and essential to its mission. I don't know if that gets at your question. I'm sure someone else might have a better perspective for that. Um, I think on the temporary position part um, and, and talking about that, especially since I think I'm the only one who is in a temporary position, um, I would say emotionally it's a hard thing in the sense that I, this is the first time in years that I've had the same address for two years. <laughs> and that's annoying because I have to keep packing up my stuff. And so um, just this sense of kind of being a nomadic librarian is a bit annoying to me. Um, and having to kind of balance that while also balancing, you know, it, it's not really a work-life balance. It's more like a moving and work balance. Um, and that gets expensive and annoying and just mentally trying. Um, but I think also it's been interesting to be working with a collection that has been employing a lot of gig catalogers because then I also see the effect that it has on the catalog itself. Um, there are some records that are fantastic in our collection. There are some that I look and go, why did you put, you know, this with this or how, I, I have no idea how you came to such a conclusion. I, I just don't know. Um, and because of the inconsistency, it, it does harm. And so, and it's, it's painful to see that. And yet, because you also are, you know, temporary, you can only do so much to fix it. So it's, it, yeah, it's, it can be hard, <laughs> to put it simply. Another issue that I can recognize with having folks being in temporary positions is that if, if you're hired to do a very specific project, which might, might be super cool and super needed, like that's the one thing you're supposed to be focusing on. And so there, there aren't opportunities to build long-term relationships either with the, the people you work with or with the collection itself to let ideas sort of grow over time um, and to work on things over time. Um, yeah. And like, I don't, personally, I think that the harm that precarious labor has on the human should be enough of a case to argue against it. But also there's an organizational loss right? Because you take all that, not only you miss an opportunity, yeah. but you take that information with you, right? Mm -hmm. If we, if, if we have to frame it in that way to get administrators to pay attention. Yeah. Yeah. I asked, uh, when I first started, I asked the main university archivist, you know, do you have all of, all of your knowledge written down somewhere? You know, I always try to start my job thinking about the person who will carry on after me. I want to make sure that things can, you know, Go long term and he goes nope <laughs> nope that's how i am you know i am the institutional knowledge here and um i will say though on the anecdote i told earlier about my former intern who went and got a you know had three months to do an archives um they were able to see what intricate work it was and it turned into a full-time um, permanent gig. So I think there is hope for that, but I think it also hinges on what Emily was saying about being able to build those relationships and develop that institutional knowledge to be able to carry that forth and to show its value, which is unfortunate that that's not always the case. Hi everyone, this is Lauren from ACRL again. Um, we have just reached the top of the hour, so I'm going to stop the recording now.